Hi everybody, Mark here from PondAlgaeSolutions.com and in this video I want to go over a, just a basic primer on the ultrasound systems, ultrasound, for algae control and algae management uh, in ponds. And we've done some videos way, way back when we started with this work, uh, almost 15 years ago I think. I, the last video I did was 12 years ago on YouTube and talked about kind of how it worked and all that and uh, you can check those out but I, I just felt that it was necessary to kind of update things a little bit and um, provide a little more information uh, of what we're seeing currently in the industry and how these systems are used. Uh, just to give you an idea of how ultrasound um, you know came about with this work. Algae like everything else in the, the world has a frequency. Uh, some type of a frequency that's going to, that it resonates at. Uh, we have it, uh, a uh, crystal glass would have a resonating frequency. And we've all heard of the story that when the opera singer hits that pitch, that perfect pitch, the glass will shatter because it started to shake and vibrate it. Um, and in a way, the ultrasound works exactly that way on algae. Uh, Obviously, folks that are much brighter than myself uh, tested out algae and found out what it resonated at, and they started to use these frequencies in systems that would provide some damage. Usually, uh, I would call it mild damage, and what I mean by that is, obviously, you're not looking to nuke the pond or shake everything to oblivion. There is a balance of using enough power to affect an algae cell, and sonar, or ultrasound that sends sound waves out into the water actually can create that that vibration. Um, it's a very mild vibration, but to the algae cell to which it's very tuned, it can start to shake it enough to damage the cellular structure of some types of algae, and then other algae it will eventually rupture an air bladder or air vacuole that it will use in its life cycle, its daily life cycle, to come to the surface to pick up photosynthesis from the sun. If that bladder gets damaged, it has to sink. It cannot rise again. And if it can't rise to get sun exposure, it, it will simply sink and die off slowly. And so in that way, um, some brilliant minds were able to come about uh, developing a technology that was very specific and targeted to algae. Uh, without harming anything else in the in the aquatic system, fish in particular, even in the early days, the biggest concern I had was, is it safe for fish? And we actually had the devices used in koi ponds back then. Koi ponds are not very large, and usually they are stocked well with fish, and the fish did fine. In fact, people would, would look us up and want to use the technology. It was widely used back years ago in that kind of setting. And it's been used in fish farms uh, of all types. I think there was one, one case that I have heard about with a catfish farm where the fish didn't feed very aggressively with the ultrasound on, but they started to just turn the system off for a certain period or a few periods in the day. Fish would feed as they normally would quite aggressively, um, and then they'd turn the system back on to make sure that their algae management was in place, and they were very happy with the results with that. That's the only instance I've ever heard of of any kind of an issue with fish, and I've never seen it firsthand. So, um, But the systems are balanced well to use just enough power to affect algae, but not enough to create cavitation or to create any kind of damage to ecosystems, if you will. And um, where, uh, where the systems evolved into, we don't, personally, I don't use them in koi ponds anymore. I don't use them in small backyard ponds anymore. I think there are more effective and cost-effective ways to deal with problems in those types of settings, but I do feel that ultrasound is exceptionally well suited to large ponds and lakes where the cost of treating either chemically or biologically or in any, any way you could deal with an algae problem, the costs get very expensive, sometimes prohibitively so, um, to where it's just too much money to deal with it, but yet the problem persists. And so ultrasound, you know, it's not, uh, it's not dirt cheap by any means, but pound for pound when you compare it to additives, which add up over time, chemical or biological, it starts to save a lot of money in some of these settings. And where the fit is right, it can 
can be wonderful. Uh, it does not fit every situation, and I'll I'll close with that comment or in a little more of a in-depth coverage there. But it, you know, it has helped a lot of people, especially on large waters. So, typical ultrasound system, very simple power box control module, which usually is land-based. There is a solar float. Uh, system available too, which we would use on very large waters, large lakes, where the system might be positioned out in the middle of it and you don't want cables running from land out there. Maybe you get boat traffic or whatever. But this is a land-based system. Control box would be near your power source. It's got uh, the power module in here, plugs in to a typical 115 three-prong outlet. Uh, there's also room for telemetry in here, which is kind of a new advancement for some of these systems to give you feedback directly to a phone or iPad or whatever uh, to tell you the system status as well as, in some cases, optionally water quality parameters that are uh, in place at the time. And so this is mounted on shore and then it connects via a transducer cable, which plugs both into the power module and then into the transducer head. The transducer head is the part that goes out in the water and is emitting the sound waves. And this would actually hang under a float from above, a couple, you know, foot or two down, maybe a few feet deep, and then it would be anchored from the bottom so that the whole system is stable. Now, this particular head provides 360 degree coverage all the way around it. It's equal. Some of the systems you'll see on the market don't provide that. Some of them are more one directional, if you will. They might have a pattern um, like this, whereas there uh, is one model that has bi-directional capability. Its, it's side to side is limited, but out on the ends, it has a, a pretty good reach. And then, you know, this device, the Pulsar uh, 3000, Pulsar 4000, which is the larger model, they both have 360 degree coverage, which is very, very nice. And uh, what can you cover with this? Well, the 3000, um, it can work in ponds depending on the algae, and that's the other key point. The denser the algae, let's say you run into a filamentous algae bloom, um, there's more density there than there is to a single cell algae, which is just a little single cell algae, just like the name implies, floating around. And you can obviously resonate that single cell much farther away from the device than you can string algae, which provides a built-in barrier, you might say. So. For our purposes, we might use um, a 3,000 on a body of water with string algae of just a few acres, you know. Uh, it wouldn't be a huge area. If it's green uh, water type algae, single cell algae, that could change to, you know, 15, 16, 17 acres. Um, this particular device is rated in meters, and so I'll provide that information below as well as on our website at pondalgaesolutions.com. You can see each product listed there and come to understand its range in terms of acre coverage and meter coverage and all that. Uh, for larger waters, uh, the 4,000 might be used in ponds of, you know, three, four, five acres for filamentous algae, and then it could go up to, you know, uh, we've used single units in 30 acres um, and, and more in some cases for the single cell algae. So each case that comes into us, each situation, we will look at the body of water um, from Google Earth, understand its shape, uh, depth, and overall configuration and size. We'll take that into account. And then most importantly, we would encourage anyone, and I do this now all the time, I do not just put these systems in and hope they'll work. I will pre-test. We, we have a lab that we utilize and we have you or whoever the pond owner is and we have them collect a sample, uh, sometimes multiple samples from around a body of water and we want to see specifically what algae species are in there, not just the type not just the general type, but the exact species of what's in there. Because this technology, as advanced as it has become, it will control most of the algae we see in the environment. However, there are a few, I would say just in general a good handful, that um, due to their cellular structure or some other behavior that they have, they make it difficult to control them with ultrasound alone. And so, uh, we want to know whether the fit is good with this technology, whether you could expect uh, a very high degree of control or something less than that to where other considerations may need to be, you know, 
brought about. And uh, in, in the best way to look at this technology, in my opinion, is it is one tool out of the many that has the potential to help completely or greatly or at least significantly enough to where you can lower the use of other traditional treatments, be it biological or chemical, and you can at least um, find some improvement to the point that it actually lowers your cost of maintenance for the pond or lake. If it doesn't do that, if the testing shows that it is not a good fit at all, then we simply don't use it and we wouldn't suggest buying it to use it. We would look at alternative ways to deal with the problem that makes the most sense. But fortunately, in the years that we've worked this, with this technology, for a long time, we found the systems to be I would say pretty accurate to say 70%, maybe 75% effective in all installations. This includes industrial settings, um, wastewater settings, uh, commercial ponds, lakes, all kinds of different places. And 75% of the time we felt pretty confident that it would work. We know it worked because the people gave us that kind of feedback. The other 25% usually involves something from an algae that was resistant or a configuration or setup that was not really appropriate for the overall spectrum of what we were dealing with in the body of water or in some cases if you're looking at industrial settings sometimes uh, it was best well it was always best to remove biofilm from a, a tank or structure before you applied the ultrasound because it really worked best to limit biofilm and if the facility didn't do a good job of cleaning if it didn't uh, do what was recommended, or if power went out for an extended period of time, you could find the biofilm starting to regrow and it appeared like the system wasn't working well. Um, so, you know, there were nuances to how it was used, but we know for a fact that 70-75% of the time we got very good positive results. And I think with these new technologies, because for instance this device has over 2,000 plus frequencies that it uses in a very tight range of frequencies in, in two bandwidths where our original system had 16 frequencies and then the one that followed that which we were using probably for almost a decade had 79 so that's a significant advancement and you know as we talked about resonance and and everything and getting that pitch or that tone from the opera singer right on the money with the uh, crystal glass. The same thing applies with this. The closer you can get to a resonant frequency of a specific algae, the more you'll affect it. And so having the density of frequencies that we have in this system now provides better control, I think. How much better? Maybe 10%. Maybe we're in the 80 percentile range for effectiveness. Uh, there will always be some situations where it just isn't the best fit and the key for us is to understand where those are when to use it when not to use it and uh, when we can use it the chances of it working well for people are pretty darn good that's what we've seen so um, and its main purpose of course is to lower the use of uh, chemical applications, chemical treatments to lower the cost of managing a large body of water, which can be inherently challenging. And uh, when it fits the bill well, uh, the people have been pretty happy with it. So um, with that, I will close in this and just say that if you have questions on anything regarding not only ultrasonic algae control, but also anything to do with your pond or algae problem, be sure to get in touch with us at pondalgesolutions.com. You can use the contact form there and send a note in. and I'll usually be the one to reply and happy to help if we can. And uh, I appreciate you joining me today and I hope you have a good day wherever you are.